Welcome to the NCW Life Evening News for Friday, July 5th. I'm Grant Olson. We hope you had a very enjoyable 4th of July. Tonight, we have a special report for our newscast. 13 years ago, Molly Linville and her husband David took over a family ranch in the Palisades that needed some tender loving care. Molly proved to be just the right person for the job and today KV Ranch is a thriving one woman operation in the mouth of Moses Cooley. Our reporter Jefferson Robbins and producer Tucker Wagner took a drive to meet the lady in charge. For the next half hour, join us for a visit to Molly's Ranch. This ranch has been in my husband's family for over 105, six years, somewhere in there. My husband's father was running it and he had kind of always said to us that he wasn't gonna leave the ranch to us and that he was gonna donate it uh, to Nature Conservancy. And so, you know, we were fine with that. That, that was his choice to make. And, and we were both working for US Fish and Wildlife Service at the time. And uh, he got sick, unfortunately, suddenly, ah. and passed away rather quickly. And lo and behold, he had left the whole ranch to us. <laughs> and so, you know, we both had federal jobs, which means, you know, we had things like health hey, insurance and paid leave and <laughs> all those kind of things. And we had to decide overnight whether we were going to become cattle ranchers or not. And I was a resounding yes, and my husband was a resounding no, because you know he's raised here and he knew how much work this was gonna be. And so um, when we got here, there was about 120 head of cows and their calves, and um, you know his father had been in his 80s and he hadn't had a hired hand for a long time, so there was just a lot of broken infrastructure in place, and so. I, I don't know if it was from being a wildlife biologist um, or what, but I just immediately took to the cattle. I was enamored at day two. <laughs> and, and so I knew I was never leaving after that. And um, what we ended up doing is my husband agreed to um, quit work for a couple of years and um, come help me sort of repair all that broken infrastructure that was on the ranch. and. And then he was clear that he was going back to an off-farm job um, after that. And really those two years got the basics put back together. I would say it took a decade to get it really operational again. Once things break, it's very expensive and, um, you know, it's just a lot of hard work. And I was still just even learning cattle and I come from a dry land farm and and so the irrigation was all new to me and so I had to learn all the learning curve was steep when I got here for sure. So we're in the Moses Cooley, which if you haven't been out here, people should come and <laughs> take an explore. This is the most westerly uh, flood of uh, Lake Missoula and so we have 800 foot basalt cliffs on either side of us and um, it's shrub step habitat. We also have 270 acres of irrigated farm ground in the bottom and that's where our house here is located. The ranch is about 6,000 acres which is plenty <laughs> and um, uh, so our precipitation out here is we get about 9 to 12 inches of rain. So water is always going to be our limiting factor out here. There used to be a lot of outbuildings. They had barns and trees and all kinds of things. And it was all in apricots. And, the old, and they froze out in the 1940s. And the only two remaining are those two trees over there. Remind me what year it was that you and David came to own the ranch. Uh, 2011. Is that right? Yes, 2011. <laughs> So 13 years on the job here, yeah. do you feel like you have adapted the ranch to what you want it to be or are there still more changes or improvements you want to make? I, I feel like I've just sort of arrived at our sweet spot. And what our sweet spot looks like is I have to run this place by myself. So it has to be manageable and 
um, I have to make enough money that there, we don't put personal finances into our ranch. And so it has to, you know, pay for itself. And it does that now. I haven't drawn a salary yet. That's the next step. <laughs> so it's just been sort of paying for itself. But I think I'm close to being able to draw a salary too, which after 13 years, we've always kept track of it. And I can't remember how much it, the ranch owes me in back salary, but it's a lot of money. We won't ever probably pay that back. But that's just really the honest, like, thing about agriculture is that um, it's really it's really hard to make a living at it when you are a small or mid-sized operator so the cattle are now doing that though and that's pretty exciting to me so my goal is to have about 300 350 head of other people's cows here during the grazing season. Uh -huh. And um, I've got, what do I have now? Like 280 here right now. So before my business was a cow calf operation, meaning I keep the cows through time and then the calves are the cash crop each year. And um, it's so frustrating because when you show up to sell them, you're a price taker, you can't set your price. Uh -huh. And so like if the market is down for who knows what reason on a particular day and that's when you bring your calves in, you you just have to take it. Yeah. <laughs> and that I worked so hard at raising those calves and to, you know, get maybe a dollar twenty a pound for them. It was just like so this is great because I send the invoices out once a month and they send me a check and you know it's I know how much the money is going to be so I can do some financial planning and it's just been working out really good and then my winters are pretty quiet. My average day is that there is no average day. I start out with a punch list every morning and Sometimes it gets filled out and completed, and sometimes one item is <laughs> done and the rest of the day gets wrecked. So uh, you just never know. Uh, feel, when we first got here, I felt like I was sort of beholden to dead people. Like I felt like I was ranching for them. And that gets really complicated, <laughs> you know, sort of mentally and emotionally. And, and so, when I switched to, I'm just gonna do the best I can, uh, that made things a lot better. Keeping large tracts of land intact is really hard. It's really, really hard. And it's a generational responsibility. It is, Every yep. generation has to like try and keep it together. Yes. Grow it if it needs to grow. Yeah, and um, it's hard to right size that because you know, I could be much bigger than I am, but there's just me and, you know, there's no housing out here. So finding a hired hand is hard. And now with Washington's new like overtime laws, um, I couldn't afford a hired hand anyways. So you have to figure out how to do, how to keep this intact <laughs> with what you've got, <laughs> I think. I don't know, seems like fun so far. <laughs> Yeah, right? This is like fresh air, sunshine. I never have to go to the gym. I am getting paid for the fence work though, right? <laughs> of course you are. <laughs> I'm going to feed you. That's okay. right. <laughs> Fair deal. It's vacation season. While a trip to Hawaii sounds great, we know what you really want is an inflation vacation. That's why Abby's feeds a group of four to six people for less than 26 bucks. Enjoy an inflation vacation at Abby's. You can be a superhero tonight and treat your family to Abby's famous hometown hero. This giant features our classic pepperoni, tasty Italian sausage, and crisp green peppers all layered together for a legendary feast. Don't miss this July special pizza at a very special price. The agents of Kennedy Real Estate Group are committed to providing the ideal client experience. 
we believe in the power of relationships. Why? Because we don't just work here, we live here. From the nonprofits we serve, the parks where we play, and the local businesses we support, our team understands the value of living in the Wenatchee Valley. Let's begin your real estate story. A ductless unit from Carrier can keep anyone comfortable. Take Shelly, for instance. She finds me time in her new attic turned home gym. And with her Carrier ductless unit, the temperature is always perfect. No matter how intense her workout gets. Carrier, total comfort, totally happy. Turn to the experts, Carrier and Alpine Air. Heat and air, call Alpine Air. What does RV stand for? Recreational vehicle or ruined vacation? At Clickit RV, we want you to have a fun, safe camping experience. So for the month of June, get to any Clickit RV store and get a professional propane leak test, tire pressure check, wheel bearings, roof, slide and battery test, and all inspections are free because we want you and yours to have a safe camping season. Thinking of upgrading? Check out their huge selection of new and used top brands like Grand Design, Rockwood, Flagstaff, Winnebago, and more. So get to a Clickit RV store near you for a free inspection and keep your family safe. Human caused fires are a big deal for us. And we're not in a fire district here. So when we have a fire, we're on our own to deal with that. Like I look back on it now and it started as the worst thing that ever happened to me. And it actually started right up on that bluff. I was sitting eating lunch in the house at two o'clock in the afternoon and this weird little squall came through and i saw the dry lightning and it wasn't but seconds later and there was smoke and then a line of flames coming over the hill it landed on blm ground which started out to be a good thing because blm showed up really quickly the fire cruised south mostly south and then it got in that little canyon back there and that's dnr ground and so I thought, oh, okay, good. DNR is gonna get after that. And my cattle were all on the other side of the road. And uh, so I wasn't worried. Um, DNR is great at putting fire out. And, but they just didn't this time. And in the evening, I came down to check on it and the winds just like, picked up, you know how they do here, just so fast. They just picked up and the fire took off. And I was like, oh, I'm in trouble. And I went back to the house and got my border collie and my ATV and bombed down there on the old railroad bed and started getting my cattle up. And the, the fire just like leapt over the road and it just whooshed up behind us. And I was, in my mind saying, I will grab my dog and drive away from these cattle if I have to. Like I was trying to prepare myself to not be stupid because um, it was very scary. But my dog, he was like, I know exactly what needs to be done here. And he got after those cows and he picked them up into a good fast track, ran them the two miles back to the house. And it was hot and loud behind us. And it was, it was the scariest thing that I've ever, ever done. And I don't ever want to do that again and I don't ever want anybody else to have to do that again. It was, it caused a lot of bad feelings because, um, you know, we had firefighters show up but not engage with the fire because they weren't in anybody's district and it wasn't really understood like who should do what when you're in unprotected lands or no man's land as some people call it. It's Cause it was literally like, who's paying for this? We don't see anybody you know, raising their hand that they're going to pay for this. So I learned that, you know, fire is devastating, but there are places that actually came back better after the burn. And so there was positives that way. And one thing that I really learned is that those firefighters that weren't engaging, I kept asking like, why, you know, why, why, what, what's the reason? And it, they say, well, there isn't anything out here. And I was just like, holy smokes, they see this as nothingness, right? Like they, they're like, it's, o it's okay to let it burn because there's nothing out here. So on our fire, we feel like 
we lost about two hundred and eighty three thousand dollars uh, worth of in infrastructure and then that's not including what to do with the cattle in the two years i put a presentation together with the help of um, a chelan fire chief who thought i probably better harness my anger in a positive way <laughs> which was a good good choice and I have gone around the state and given the presentation on the value of, I call it range ground, because that seems to be the terminology that people can kind of wrap their mind around. And then tied it to the state's economic impacts and, and, and the cattle industry and, and you know, talked about how much a mile of fence costs to replace. And Were you able to negotiate something from that point to where this area has some degree of fire protection now? Yes and no. There aren't enough people that live out in Palisades to pay for the level of service that would be expected if they annexed this in, right? Like the taxation isn't gonna be enough to pay for doing fire suppression out here. We had the BLM come and talk to us about rangeland fire protection associations, which means that we would um, form, it's a 501c3 nonprofit. You, uh, it's, you get insurance, you have a, usually a board of directors of some kind and you run it as a nonprofit. And then you can get surplus firefighting equipment once you're certified. But, and they use them in Oregon, and Idaho, and Wyoming, and, and uh, all the time with great success on these places like this. And, um, but they're not legal in the state of Washington. And so I did, I think, five rounds of legislation with Representative Tom Dent to get them legalized so that we could do that because um, we felt like it was our only option and um, it it always gets turned down by the firefighters union so they always fight it and so it's it we've never we've never got there but the piece of legislation that also representative dent got across the finish line two legislations ago was that local fire chiefs can call in air support on initial attack and that's really important because before they couldn't until it was, had the fire had gone state mobilization. Well, like there, there was no getting equipment up there, right, to put fire out. If we could have got one dump of water on that, it could have all been done. And I said, well, can you also make it so that local fire chiefs can uh, make, make that happen on land that's in unprotected lands that's adjacent to their districts? And so, um, that has just been such a game changer. Last summer, you know, we, that legislation had already gone through and um, very ironically, some people were shooting on our ranch and they set, caught it on fire. And I, I ran down to find the fire chief because I didn't know if they knew that legislation. It was fresh. They had just gone through. It was there. But as I got there, here comes helicopter one. And it was in ground like this where they couldn't get to it. And they put it out with three helicopter dumps. And so I think that is the piece that has been a game changer. Getting to know the, the adjacent fire chiefs and... and and that we're here and they know us now and we know them and, you know, um, it, we're, I just don't feel like we're as alone in this as we used to be because they don't want these fires to get ahead of steam here in unprotected land because it's going to end up in their district rolling along at 14 miles an hour, you know, if they don't catch it here. So um, I think we're, I think we're all just figuring it out. As sheriff, I arrested rioters, rapists, and mass murderers, locked up human traffickers who preyed on women and children. On my watch, everyone was accountable. Despite being the attorney general for 12 years, Bob Ferguson does not take responsibility for the rapid increase in crime and homelessness, businesses moving out of state, and jobs lost. And he thinks he deserves a promotion? Dave Reichert. In Digital Media Arts program, we learn about video production gear and editing by the combination of class projects and nonprofit work and employment. It makes things happen. Yeah. It's pretty magical. We work in the industry at the Wenatchee Road, NCW Life Channel, and the Town Toyota Center events. 
Every day we work with industry standard equipment for a hands-on learning experience. I'm Keith Gaynor, running to be your next 12th District State Senator. It has been a privilege to serve you the past six years in the House of Representatives. I believe public safety is a critical issue that affects all of Washington. This should be one of our highest priorities. Washington families are struggling. Housing, food, and gas prices are severely affecting our budgets. We need to find better ways to support our families. Together, we can build a better Washington. The Lake Chelan Chamber of Commerce presents Wonders of Wooden Avenue. Welcome to the newest and funnest fashion boutique on Wooden, featuring mountain chic clothing and men's footwear from Ugg, Brixton, Sorrell, and Free People. Walk on into the Tiffany Blue Building on the second block of Wooden and check it out. It is nearly impossible to describe what you'll find in Lush Life. It's an eclectic collection of items from around the world. See it for yourself at the corner of Wooden and Emerson. Wonders of Wooden Avenue, North Central Washington's premier shopping district. So this cave, and this is, this is the version of the story we know, like it might not be 100% accurate, but the Appledale um, Fruit Company that, you know, at the old house that we were at, um, they wanted to store apricots in this cave. And um, then when they went in it, there was all kinds of artifacts. They would come down, you know, sort of off the Waterville Plateau and even Brewster and that kind of area and because the winters were a little bit easier down here and it's pretty fun to think about what got talked about in this cave. I think it's neat. One of the things that you tried to do when you took over this ranch was to try to reconstitute the health of the soil. Yep. So tell me what you saw in the way the soil was operating here and what kind of results did you try to achieve? Yeah, so some of that it was from you know sort of my scientific curiosity about soils and some of it was literally from economics and so we at that time were um, farming the, the irrigated ground pretty traditionally we were mostly raising alfalfa hay and when we first got here we actually had um, a farmer who was doing the farming for us and um, did a great job and no complaints there but um, it was, you know, in, it was inputs like fertilizer and herbicides, and that gets really expensive. And pretty soon that those economics aren't working for you anymore. And I um, have turned those irrigated, they're under pivot irrigation um, uh, circles into perennial pastures. When you put them out in this native range ground that has sort of nine to 12 inches of precip a year. I was having to move them every one to three days into a new area because it's a little bit fragile when it's growing. And so that's time consuming, right? Like it gets hard to do that well. And so now the cows are here during the growing season and then they can be out on the range ground on that good grass out there um, when it's dormant, because when it's dormant, um, you don't damage the grasses um, because they're not, they're not, like they don't get bitten off and then try to hurry and, and grow back. They just get bitten off and there's nothing, you know, and then the cows move on naturally. So I've changed things around so that um, I can use both, but uh, in the, in, and this is, I can run twice as many cows on this irrigated ground as I could have out on the range ground. So even though it's much smaller acreages. So when I first planted, after we changed from sort of, you know, a, an alfalfa operation um, to just grazing, the grass that I seeded out here uh, didn't look great. <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh, because the nutrients had already been sort of sucked out of the ground. And so then I, when I started, wrote, you know, the, as you can see, the cows are close together and, and um, started rotationally grazing the cows through. So their manure added organic matter back to the soil. Grass needs a disturbance. Like it needs to either be burned or nipped or mowed or something for it to signal to grow again. And so them eating the grass and then me giving the grass time to came, come back um, made these pastures just 
really come back to life. And we're learning a lot about like the, the biology and the soil. And for example, cow's saliva has bacteria in it that's important for um, the microbes in the ground. Really? Yeah. And it's a, sim it's a very symbiotic relationship. And so if you don't have that microbial activity in the, in the soils, um, you, you don't have, you know, good growth from grass. And so um, it's been really fun watching this place spring back to life when those fields started getting healthier, and by healthier, I mean a wide range of plant species that are out there, the first thing that came back was amphibians that I hadn't seen since I had gotten here. And, you know, there's, we had woodhouse toads, we have um, salamanders, we have uh, tree frogs, we have all kinds of amphibians, and they're always kind of the canary in the coal mine, right, to tell you that you've got something wrong. So to see them come back with doing nothing other than not putting chemical inputs out there and seeding it into grasses was pretty exciting to me. Biodiversity is important mm. above ground, and it's important in the soil. There's, a, there's more biodiversity in the soil as far as you know, fungi, microbes, bacteria. It's cool because there's the same predator-prey relationship going on below the ground. There's, there's predators eating the prey species and that's feeding the plants and as there is on, you know, above ground, which is really fascinating. And we don't, we don't think about what's going on under our feet at all. And it's, it's probably even more fascinating than what's going on above ground. And, um, well, if you're a nerd, I guess, maybe. <laughs> With the cattle specifically, we're seeing much higher weaning rates on the calves. Um, one thing, and we can measure some of that, which is nice, so it's not just a sort of a, a sense of it. The butter fat in these cows' milk, even in the beef cows' milk, is way higher on these diverse pasture mixes that they're eating on out here. And so higher butter content in milk creates a bigger calf every time. And, um, and that you just don't get if you're feeding hay or silage. Um, and so there's that benefit. The moms are in such good condition that they breed back very well every year. So you get higher conception rates um, when the nutrients are high and that's really important to your bottom line um, to make sure that you get every one of those cows bred because you know that's that's a basically year-long process and so if you get to the end of that year and you don't get a calf out of that cow well she's just cost you a bunch of money without giving back and so um, being able to increase those um, uh, are, is really important to your bottom line as a rancher. This coming winter, uh, we're going to try a vacation. Nice. We've already freaking out about it a little bit. <laughs> and the, but the thing is, is like, I mean, time's just going to go by and we would not have enjoyed, you know, some things that he wants to do because I'm content every day here. Like if I didn't have to go to the store to buy beer, I wouldn't leave the ranch. <laughs> the solution to that is you learn how to make beer? That's, I mead is what I'm trying to learn how to make. Because <laughs> we have a lot of honey on the ranch. You know? I had my suspicions. <laughs> Hello, television family. Grab your cup of coffee each weekday morning and join me. I'm Dan Koontz, the host of Wake Up in Anchee Valley. It's Wake Up in Anchee Valley. It's everything you need to start your day. We're live and we're local at 7 a.m. every weekday on the NCW Life Channel. Thank you for joining us for this special newscast tonight. You can watch this story again at ncwlife.com or on our mobile app for iPhone and Android. And remember, if you see news happening, we'd like to hear from you. Email us at news at ncwlife.com or give us a call at 888-6295. We'll be back on Monday with our regular NCW Life evening news broadcast. I'm Grant Olson. Have a great weekend.